Story 1, Daily Mass and Confession at My Catholic High School, or, How I Kept Myself and Friends from Any Consequences of Our Troublemaking. I was raised in a devout Roman Catholic family, who sent myself and my siblings to Catholic-run schools from kindergarten through high school. For this to make sense, some basic understanding of Catholic religious doctrine is needed, I'll keep it brief. Catholics practice something called the Sacrament of Holy Confession. The belief is that if you confess your sins to a priest, and truly repent for what you've done, the priest has the power to forgive your sins in the eyes of God. Most churches will have things called confessionals for this purpose, while some newer ones are small rooms with chairs. The classic confessional is like a small closet, with a priest sitting in a closet next to you, separated by a privacy screen. Usually, confession will be held after a morning daily mass service. One or more priests will set up in the confessional, congregants will go in one by one and say their confession, etc. Now, the bond of the confessional is absolutely sacrosanct within the church. Think of it like lawyer slash client privilege. A priest is never ever supposed to share anything they learn in the confessional, nor act on any information they learn. Priests have been executed by their government for refusing to testify in a trial about something they hear in a confessional. If a priest is found to have broken this bond, he will be defrocked, basically kicked out of the priesthood, and could possibly even be excommunicated, kicked out of the entire church, shunned, rejected by any devout Catholic, etc. It's a big deal. So much so that the policy for priests is that even if they later learn something through normal means that they originally first learned in the confessional, they are not allowed to act on that information, lest it even gives the impression to the person who confessed that the priest was breaking the bond of the confessional. This last part is important. Well, sophomore year my Catholic high school had its administration taken over by the Celestians, a religious order, brothers slash monks, who are dedicated to educating children. Our new principal was a salesian priest, and started holding daily mass in our campus chapel every morning before classes. He really encouraged folks to go. Despite his efforts, never really took off. Would just be the usual one to two super devout teachers, maybe a particularly religious student or so. Then one Monday morning, right after homeroom, we hear the not uncommon announcement over the PA will the following students report to the principal's office immediately. Most of the time this happened when those students were getting disciplined for some weekend shenanigans, at a private school, so we could be punished for that sort of thing. Someone threw a raging kegger, someone's parents found out, called the school, and now everyone involved was getting punished. This is when I had my epiphany. Next Monday morning I was at morning mass, bright and early. Right at the front of the line to go into the confessional afterwards. Sat down with Father Jim, and confessed to him in great detail all the trouble I and my friends had gotten up to over the weekend. Where we went, who did what, and to whom everything. The first time I think he was kinda surprised, gave me some acts of contrition to perform, said the absolution, and sent me on my way. I think the first few times he was actually pleased with himself, thinking, I'm really starting to teach these kids. But I'm pretty sure that by midway through the semester he'd caught on to what I was doing. Every now and then he'd make a sly reference or crack a smile. But he couldn't stop me lol. You see, by going and confessing everything we did over the weekend to our principal first thing Monday, I was putting all that info into the bonds of the confessional. Anything I told him there, father would never be able to act on, without risking serious consequences. If he got to his office, and his first message was from my friend's mom explaining how she'd caught us all drunk as skunk smoking cigarettes in the alley behind her house. He could thank her for the info. But he couldn't punish us for it. Because I'd already told him 20 minutes earlier all about it in the confessional. This tradition lasted all the way through senior year slash graduation. Served me and my friends well. Some other folks must have figured things out as time went on, by the time I graduated the Monday mass sessions were always well attended, and father had to start doing them earlier to save time for all the confessions he was hearing before classes. I don't know if it was me or father who was guilty of the malicious compliance here. Did we play him, by going to confession like he insisted, but for our own selfish reasons? Or did he play us, doing some 4D chess shit? I mean, after all, in just two years, he somehow managed to get dozens and dozens of high school students to start regularly attending mass before class, and going to confession weekly. Win-win? LOL. This story is absolute gold. It's one of those rare cases where the system's rigid rules ended up playing right into the hands of some crafty high schoolers. The whole setup, using confession to make themselves untouchable, sounds like something out of a heist movie. It's honestly brilliant how they turned such a strict doctrine into a shield for their mischief, while technically doing exactly what the principal wanted. And it seems like Father Jim was in on the game by the end, but he just let it ride because it served his bigger purpose. He managed to get a whole school full of teens attending mass and confession regularly, which is no small feat. It's like they thought they were working the system, but maybe the priest was the real mastermind here, turning teenage defiance into regular devotion. Whether the students were pulling a fast one on him or he was playing a long game, everyone kind of got what they wanted, a clever loophole turned into a win-win. 
The fact that the Monday confessional line just kept growing is proof that sometimes, a bit of malicious compliance has the power to start an unlikely tradition. This is just too good. Story 2, guy who flips out over his internet speed, gets less. So, a little backstory. I work for an internet provider company as a lead in the internet repair department. This means that I get calls from agents who work there who either need help with a situation because they are stuck and don't know what to do, or when a customer escalates the call asking for a supervisor, manager, or someone above them. My department mainly handles internet issues like being offline, outages, replacing equipment, etc. So, the other day was like any other. I'm getting calls from agents needing equipment transferred from one account to another, scheduling a technician for customers who refuse to do any troubleshooting, the list goes on and on. One of my main calls is an agent asking for me to run a special tool that corrects the speed being sent to a customer. This usually happens when a customer upgrades or downgrades their internet speed and it doesn't take right away, and this only takes a couple of minutes. This comes in later. On this particular day, I get a call from an agent who says her customer wants to speak to a supervisor because he is not getting the speeds he pays for. This happens quite a lot, usually because most people don't understand how the internet works and all the factors that come into the result of a speed test. This can include a lot of things, like how far away you are from your router, if you are testing on Wi-Fi or directly connected, how many devices you are currently using, and even things like how your residence is built, because stone and concrete do not allow Wi-Fi signals to travel through. When I looked at the customer's account, I see that he is currently subscribed to 100 Mbps, megabits per second. Our normal plans are 300, 500, and a gig, which is 1000. I asked the agent what results he was getting, and she told me it was 437 Mbps, which is way over what he is paying for. I told the agent to go ahead and transfer him to me, and I'll continue the discussion. Once the customer gets to me, we'll call him Darren, I introduce myself and ask how I can help. Darren immediately begins yelling and cursing at me about how he is not getting what he pays for and is extremely upset, and even demanding credit to his account because of this. I began to try and apologize to Darren and explain that speed test results can vary based on certain conditions. He cuts me off and states that he is recording the call and will be posting everything I say on social media. I tell him that that is fine, as all our calls are recorded for quality assurance purposes as well, and everything will be documented. Darren then proceeds to continue cursing stating that this is unacceptable, and I should be ashamed of myself for working for a company that does not provide the product people are paying for. While he rants on and on, I notice that he had recently changed his internet plan from 500 Mbps to 100 Mbps two days ago. Now, as I mentioned before, sometimes the internet changes don't happen right away, and we have to run a specific tool to fix it. This can happen when the modem has not been reset to reflect these changes. I try to tell Darren that he is receiving more than what he is paying for, and again, he cuts me off stating that he will be reporting us to the FCC, and BBB, and filing a lawsuit about this, all while recording our conversation. Now, normally I wouldn't care, and I'd allow the speed to continue going through until the system automatically fixes it. But his attitude and rude demeanor made me feel otherwise. Cue the malicious compliance. I respond to Darren saying, Sir, you are absolutely right. And I am so sorry you are not receiving the speeds you are paying for. I will get this fixed right away. Now, this plan that Darren was on, the 100 speed, is a plan that only certain customers can get if they are financially unable to make normal payments, meaning he had to apply for this program and be approved, based on his low income. So, I ran the fixed tool on his internet and reduced the speed down to 100 as he requested. I then ask him how his speed results are now. Darren then responds, it's even worse than it was before. What kind of trick are you trying to pull on me? I responded, sir, you told me you were not getting the speeds you were paying for, and you were right. You recently applied for financial assistance to be downgraded to 100, and I fixed that for you. It was absolutely wrong of us to be sending you 500 when you were only paying for 100. I apologize for the inconvenience. After a few minutes of silence, Darren then muffled to himself, this is ridiculous and proceeded to disconnect the call. I left notes on his account so any future agent would know what had happened that day, and that he was not entitled to any credit on his bill. All I can say is, be careful what you complain about. This story is peak be careful what you wish for. Darren went in guns blazing, convinced he was getting shortchanged, only to be met with the reality that he was actually receiving more than what he paid for. The fact that he downgraded to a 100 Mbps plan and didn't realize he was still benefiting from higher speeds makes it all the more satisfying. The way you handled it was perfect, staying polite, professional, and giving him exactly what he wanted, even if he didn't really understand it himself. This is an amazing example of letting someone's own demands work against them. He thought he was catching the company in a scam, but instead, he just downgraded himself right out of his own internet speed. Sometimes, people just can't see that kindness can be hidden in the small things, like getting a speed boost without asking. 
But hey, if you go around demanding what you're paying for, then don't be surprised when that's exactly what you end up with. Story 3. HOA receives a check for all fines. Short history. Fall 2005, SO and I buy our first house together, we're happy. Baby's on the way. House is cute and in a new subdivision, HOA just formed. We're at the end of a blunt cul-de-sac, quiet, no traffic. Neighbors nice. Three-ish years later, the US economy shit the bed and wiped with the drapes. Over half of the homes in our subdivision have been foreclosed on or are in the process. Me and mine aren't paying on our mortgage. We've moved out, and a family friend and his family have moved in. They lost their house. He pays me a discounted rent, I'm not paying the mortgage, but maintaining the house with his rent. The HOA is having troubles maintaining the common areas and keeping things clean because of lack of funds. Junky cars and dead slash dying landscaping are everywhere. One home burned to its foundation. A few months after my friend moves in, red, fire lane paint is applied to the curbs of all the cul-de-sacs in the subdivision. I'm furious because it prevents street parking in front of the house. Anytime I need to stop by to fix something or my tenant has a guest we must park in front of a neighbor's house or in the common collector streets and walk in. I call the local fire department to ask why they need so many fire lanes seeing how there were no hydrants nearby. They told me they hadn't requested additional fire lanes, nor had they asked for curbs to be painted. They said anyone can just paint a curb red, it's the signage or a hydrant's presence that makes it a legal fire lane. The paint's just there to help you interpret the signage. I check and sure enough, no signs. Come to find out it's a ploy by the HOA to drum up more funds. If they paint curbs red and call it a safety zone, their bylaws allow them to fine a homeowner for violating the safety zone. Funny also that the HOA president leaves at the end of one of the cul-de-sacs and now the neighbors can no longer park in front of her house without getting safety zone fines. One evening, just past twilight, wearing a high-vis vest, safety glasses, and work boots I paint over the red curb with boring gray paint, specifically designed for concrete with great coverage. I do the entire cul-de-sac. Three weeks later it's red again. Two days late, gray. Five weeks, red. Then gray with silicone top sealer. Then red, that flakes off almost immediately. Then red again, flakes. Then a sign that reads safety zone no parking. For lack of payment, the home is now under notification of foreclosure and I'm working with an agency to help navigate and file all the paperwork needed so we can short sell. Short selling in this context means that although we promised to pay the bank $350,000 plus interest for the house, they'd forgive any amount we own as long as we turn the house over in good condition. For example not flush concrete down the toilets or poke pinholes in the water pipes. Which screws us, but it's better than owing $350,000 on a house worth only $165,000 that will be legally taken from us in short order. F you Reagan. I'm still waiting for that trickle. During a short sale, you're required to notify any potential parties that could have liens on the house. This includes the HOA, I'm up to date on my dues, and have no outstanding violations. So I think I'm in the clear. But no, the HOA suddenly comes up with a whole list of violations that haven't been addressed or remedied for 5 months. Plus additional fines for the delay. The HOA said they notified me in November, but can't seem to produce copies of these multiple notices of violation. They only have the current one in March listing all the outstanding violations. Examples, black stains on driveway, uncoiled garden hose, unapproved tree, missing bush, missing foliage, dead tree. I informed them that the stains were tire marks from driving into the garage. The unapproved tree they did, in fact, approve. The missing bushes, they approved the removal. Here's a copy of the plan and your approvals with your name on it. It's not my fault you don't know what you approved. The dead tree. Many trees, tend to lose leaves in the fall. Like around November. They might look dead if you're just making up violations in February, but are just dormant and waiting for spring. Even if it was dead you can't replace a tree in November, December, January, or February. No nurseries sell saplings that late in the season, unless you want a yuletide tree. How can someone be reasonably expected to replace a dead tree in the off-season? The HOA delays responding, and the short sale is on a timer. If I don't have all legal items, payments for liens, and documents into the escrow officer by the due date, my short sale will fall through and I'll owe $350,000 plus interest on a $165,000 house that's soon to be foreclosed on. The HOA fines and fees total $1,955. $45 short of where felony fraud starts. I'm furious. This HOA is gonna F me one last time, and I'll pay for the experience. So I talk to the escrow officer and see what she needs. Only the money for the HOA lien and you'll close escrow tomorrow. She's seen reams of these come through with similar amounts of fines requested by HO as that hold up short sales. None exceed $2,000. I ask her what form of payment will satisfy her as an escrow officer. Money order, cash, or check. A check would be easiest for you, don't you think? 
If I write a check to HOA for $1,955, then hand it to you, that'll satisfy escrow? Yep. You'll mail the check to HOA after the document's record? Yes. You'll have a check in 25 minutes. The next day. On the phone with the escrow officer. Sitting in my car in a parking lot. 9.01 AM. Did the documents record? Did the short sale go through? Yes. I'll mail out finalized documents and any other items before close of business, today. Thank you. Hang up. I walk into the local branch of my bank and inform the teller, I need to place a stop payment on a check. The fallout? HOA never tried to collect or contact us again. This is a masterclass in outsmarting the HOA at their own game. You meticulously followed every rule, documented every detail, and when the HOA tried to squeeze out one last payment, you turned the tables. Their strategic decision to keep the fines just under felony fraud territory showed how calculated they were, but you matched their precision and added a dose of well-deserved spite. The stop payment at the end was the perfect finishing touch, just when the HOA thought they had you cornered, you left them empty-handed. The Red Curb War was hilarious, too. They were so focused on trying to control the neighborhood that they completely lost track of how absurd their own rules and punishments were getting. You showed how satisfying it can be to know the system inside and out, and use that knowledge to ensure they couldn't push you around. This is some top-tier malicious compliance, and they got exactly what they deserved. Story 4. You don't want me to help customers in different department? Then don't be surprised by complaints. About 10 years ago I applied to work at a retail store selling different tech. It is a rather large chain in the UK and can get pretty busy, especially after 5 p.m. or during holidays slash sales. When I applied for a job I wanted to go to the computing department as I was very passionate about different builds and had some experience in building my own PC, instead I was temporarily placed on white goods, fridges, washing machines, etc., for training, even after I have admitted I know absolutely nothing about them. But no, apparently this knowledge should have been inherited through my genes since I am a girl, so I must know about them and be very good. So I bit my tongue and waited as I needed money and was fresh out of uni. About a few months in I realized I was not going to be transferred to the computing department, no matter how much I wanted to. My sales were good but the managers wouldn't budge as they were scared I might advise something wrong. It was the start of a school term and the store was getting petty busy. A couple came in wanting to buy a PC for their teenage kid to game on, I wanted to help them as a fellow gamer myself, but got rudely pulled back by my manager and was told unless we are assigned to a specific department, we are not allowed to help customers or advise them. So he fetched another colleague who carried on assisting the parents. As it was quiet in my department I was doing some tidying up around the store and heard the colleague trying to sell the parents one of the Apple PCs saying they would be great for gaming and all professionals use them, at the time we had a bigger commission from Apple brand. Let me tell you they are not the best machines for gaming and if you are into heavier games they are likely not going to run that well or be incompatible with the OS. I don't know what else the colleague said, but the parents believed him and got an iMac for the kid. The manager was very proud of the colleague and told me to use him as an example of a good sale for the store. I told him I could have topped it and the customer will come back with a return, but was told again not to go to computing department. Q malicious compliance. A few days later it was a busy day in the store, especially PCs due to back to school sale. A few people were off sick due to being overworked so the computing department had like two people on the floor, including the work colleague who sold the iMac. The parents came through the door with the PC they got, which usually means something broke down or they wanted to return it. They saw the guy who sold them the PC and started heading his way. He saw them too and decided it was time to go on lunch, leaving one colleague on the floor in the department. The parents are visibly getting angry and try to go to the till, but after being in the queue are told to catch another colleague from the tech department as we can't process refunds at the till for large items. The parents approach me as I don't have much to do and ask for help. I would be happy to do so, but remembering what the manager said I had to tell them I can't as I am not allowed to do anything with the PC department as it is a store policy. The parents approach more colleagues and keep hearing the same excuse. Obviously, they are getting more and more angry and so are other customers who want to buy something but can't since only people in the computing department are allowed to sell stuff for computers. They try to grab the only person on the floor, but he is already busy with other customers and can't assist them while the other colleague responsible for the sale signed out for the day and the other is late. In about 20 minutes there's a massive queue by the tills of angry customers demanding to speak to the manager. The poor person at the till has no choice but to fetch the store manager and floor managers due to the amount of angry customers. They are trying to shift the blame on us, and other store colleagues, but I mentioned what the other manager said about not touching anything in tech department or helping customers as we are not authorized, and since it is a company policy and we haven't received the training we have to comply. Of course, it makes customers even more angry and feel like their time is wasted, resulting in a commotion by the tills and further delays for other customers. 
I am unsure how the entire situation ended, as I was grabbed by an older lady to help her, but that day we had a lot of complaints on different websites about the policy and store staff refusing to help as it is not their department and we had a few brainstorming sessions after how to reduce complaints with none of the ideas taken on board. You would hope they would learn something and change the policy, but no. They gave extra training to the people already in the computing department and allowed other colleagues to sell smaller items like mice, keyboards, consoles, games, and printers but not the laptops or PC or VR, resulting in more complaints. Last time I have been there to buy my mom a new laptop, had a voucher, the situation seemed to have stayed the same, as we ended up waiting around 45 minutes for someone to push the sale through. At least I got a chance to complain to the store manager as well telling him everything I think about that store policy. Wow, this story is both hilarious and frustrating. It's incredible how OP was fully capable of helping customers in the computing department, but management's rigid, short-sighted policy completely backfired. They wouldn't let her assist outside her assigned area, even though she knew her tech far better than some of the other employees, and of course, this led to chaos. The manager thinking it was a good sale to push an iMac for gaming is just painful. It's almost funny how predictable it was that the parents would come back, disappointed. And the way things escalated into a line of frustrated customers who couldn't get help. It's like the policy was made to create problems rather than solve them. Honestly, I think OP handled it brilliantly. Sometimes the best way to show how broken a policy is, is to follow it exactly and let the consequences unfold. And the cherry on top? OP got to complain directly to the store manager when they returned as a customer. It's amazing how some places refuse to adapt, even when they get endless complaints. This is a solid lesson for management everywhere. Trust your employees' expertise or be ready for some epic I told you so moments. Thanks for watching. If you like these stories, give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more. See you in the next video.